So today we launched the Barra Center for Breakthrough Separations and Separations Materials. Um, and just to give you a bit of background, that center is named after Richard Barra. And Richard Barra was a membrane or an absorption and membrane scientist who worked at Imperial College. He was the head of the chemistry department for some period, but he worked at Imperial College through the 60s and 70s, and he's very well known for his contributions in the area of zeolites and also in permeation through rubbery materials. And in fact, the unit of permeation through rubbery materials is the Barra. So to honor Richard Barra, Professor Barra, we named our center the Barra Center. And as part of opening that center, we're particularly pleased to, ha to have with us today Richard Barra's daughter, who still lives in London. Christine Schwab is with us today, and also her husband. So it's great to have them there. And to complete the symmetry, we're also able to have one of Richard Barra's former PhD students, Richard Baker. So we've got two Richards. Richard Baker was a PhD student of Richard Barra's who graduated. He received his PhD from Imperial College in 1966. And Richard currently serves as Membrane Technology and Research's principal scientist, but I think the title doesn't really do him justice. He was the founder of Membrane Technology and Research, and he served as the president for 25 years. Now he likes to say he's just one of the scientists, but I suspect he's still more of a force behind the business. In that time, MTR has become a leading membrane research, development, engineering, and production company, concentrating on the production of membranes and membrane systems for industrially and environmentally significant separations. Um, Richard is currently leading MTR's new development program for membrane-based biomass biofuel separations. Richard is the author of more than 100 papers and, I think very impressively, more than 100 patents. Um, so that's a very, very high number of patents, and these are all in the membrane area. There's three editions of his book, Membrane Technology and Applications, and Richard, we do have it in the Imperial College Library, the latest edition, as well as the, the previous ones. Um, he serves, it's been published in 2004, and then again in two th 2000, 2004, and the last edition was in 2012. Richard serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Membrane Science, and he's previously been on the editorial boards of the Journal of Controlled Release, the Industrial and Engineering Chemistry Research, and separation and purification technology. He served as the editor of the NAMS quarterly newsletter for several years. So those who are members of NAMS will know that we get that every quarter and it's full of information about what's going on in the membrane world and in patents as well as academic publications. He is a founder and past president of the International Controlled Release Society and co-founder of the North American Membrane Society, NAMS. And in 2002, he was the recipient of the first NAMS Alan S. Michaels Award for Innovation in Membrane Science and Technology, which is the leading award that NAMS offer every two to three years to outstanding membrane scientists. So Richard, it's a great pleasure to have you here today. And Richard is going to tell us about the development of the membrane separation industry. Over to you, Richard. Okay. Richard Barrow was, uh, was a, very, um, uh, a very formal guy, a very uh, quiet guy, a very, quite a stiff guy, and I was always very much in awe of him. I, I never called him anything other than sir. Uh, I, well, I never referred to him in any other way other than pr the professor. There was only one professor. And uh, he would come into the lab uh, once a week or thereabouts, he, I had a little desk and an apparatus and a chair. He, I, I stood up, he sat down. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I showed him everything I'd done, uh, and, and uh, we came back uh, uh, the next week and so forth. And I learned a lot from the guy. Not, not so much from his wagging his finger and, and giving me lectures, but just, just the constant interaction with, with someone with very high standards. I mean, Alan Bauer had very high standards. And, and even a guy like me, after a bit, you begin to fi figure out, I, if I'm going to fit in, I have to sort of do it right. And so I did learn a lot. And in 1966, I, I went to America and never came back. So, okay. So what am I going to talk about today? 
Uh, if you take a class on unit operations in 1963, when I, when I came to uh, Imperial, you'd have, you probably would have done distillation, extraction, crystallization, maybe a little bit on an absorption, a little bit less on adsorption, and you probably would have done filtration, the separation of solids from, from, from liquids. You wouldn't have done anything on membrane separations. So by membrane separations, I mean molecular separations using a membrane. All of that was in the future. Salt from water, proteins from cheese whey, oxygen from air. These are all the applications that were developed post uh, uh, 1963. And I'm going to talk about that uh, today. How, how did that, that new unit operation get created? So I'll, my talk will be uh, in the beginning. I'll talk a little bit about what it was like in 1963. And then I'll talk about the development of this new unit operation. And I'll do it by, by going through ROUF and then gas separation last. And what I, uh, maybe after I've, I prepared my talk, I, I went back and changed this slide because I realized the development of this new unit operation is not a story about could it work or can it work? It's really, it, it was established it could work. What, was re, what it was really about was could it work economically? And, and that, that I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate as we go along. And then at the very end, I'll, I'll just touch on what might happen in the future. Okay, so in 1963, there were no industrial applications of membranes. Um, there were a few analytical applications. Membranes were sometimes used in biological laboratories to filter out bacteria or viruses or whatever uh, when you're preparing some sterile solution. But there were no industrial applications of any, any sort, really. The total membrane market was probably less than $20 million in today's money. And, but there was some research interest. And in fact, uh, Barrow wrote the book. And this is, uh, at that time, there weren't too many books about uh, uh, diffusion and membranes, but, but Barrow, Barrow wrote the book, which is one of the reasons in that book, the unit of permeability that he, 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 he characterized all, all the, the gas separation that he did was, was what we now call the Barrow, hence the name stuck. And so he's lived on in history. So this uh, is the uh, development. Uh, of, of, of the membrane separation industry. I'm going to work through this chart, so don't get too worried. You'll, you'll see it several times. Um, right at the beginning, beginning in the 40s, really, and uh, late 30s, early 40s, and through to the 50s, Barrow was making these systematic measurements of, of permeability and, and laying the foundation of the thing. But what really set the whole... Th the whole industry going was this development. In 1963, two guys, Loeb and Surajin, developed a great membrane. And they made that membrane for a process called reverse osmosis. So not everybody here maybe is, is completely a membrane guy, so maybe I'll explain what RO is. If you have a membrane, here's a membrane, that, that is selective for salt from water, that is it permeates water, but it doesn't, doesn't permeate salt. And that's pretty easy membrane to get. Most membranes will do it, and you can get membranes which will do it extremely well. If you put such a membrane between a solution of water and then a salt solution, maybe say seawater, then what will happen because of the difference in concentration between pure water here and slightly diluted water on the other side, there'll be a flow of water which will go from the water into the salt. Now, that was known in 1850 and thereabouts. Traub and Pfeffer and a whole bunch of guys uh, devised membranes and started measuring uh, the osmotic pressure. That is, they would let this, mem this process go until the pressure on the permeate side, or the salt side, built up to the point where there was equilibrium. There was no more flow because the hydrostatic pressure was compensated for the concentration difference. And that was then that, 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 that idea was, or those results were incorporated by Van Hoff in the Van Hoff equation at about the turn of the, the last century. So this was all known. And in the 1930s, some guy, whose name I've now forgotten, 
but did in fact suggest the process called reverse osmosis. And his brilliant thought was, well, OK, if I, if I, if I apply a hydrostatic pressure that is bigger than the osmotic pressure, I can drive water from the salt side into the water side, and I could generate desalted water. So th this was sort of known. It didn't work. And the reason it didn't work, or at least it didn't work economically, was that the very thinnest membrane you could make was maybe 10 or 20 microns thick. It was extremely thin. That's about that's one mil. That's thinner than a sheet of paper. But even so, that membrane, uh, that very thin membrane, had a terrible flux, a very, very low flux, because it was too thick. And that was the invention of this guy, at least one of them, that's half of the team, that's Sid Loeb and Suravas and Suvarajan. Sid Loeb was a graduate student of mature years. He, uh, he, he'd, he'd left school, he'd worked for about 30 years. He decided, I'm not quite sure how old he was, and this is a couple of years after he got his PhD, and he went back to school and got a PhD. And Suravas and Suvarajan was a postdoc. And so the two of them had a little grant to figure out how to desalt water. And they started making membranes to do it, and they turned up this membrane. I won't go into how they made it, but it, what it consists of is a dense skin on the top and a microporous sublayer below it. And it's the, the dense skin does the separation. The dense skin is extremely thin, maybe less than a micron thick. And the substructure is just there that provided the strength you needed. So this membrane, even though it was a micron thick, you could pick it up, you could use it, you could, you could do something with it. So, so th and this membrane had more than 20 times the permeance of any membrane anybody had made before. And this was a pretty good paper that they, uh, that they came out with. And they, they, they showed, and they were right, that this made reverse osmosis potentially an economical way of, of desalting water. And, and it, when, when, when Loeb once told me that uh, he, he uh, took out a patent on the process, he and Surajan took out a patent, and they were thinking, or Sid was thinking, that he would maybe pay his kids' way through college on the royalties from his patent. But unfortunately, what they patented was the recipe. It had taken them a bunch of time and a bunch of effort to figure out how to make uh, this thing. So, so they patented, you know, it's got magnesium perchloride and it's got acetone and the dish of that, and then you turn around three times and you put this. So a very elaborate uh, recipe, which gave a pretty good membrane. And that's what they patented. What they really should have patented, the anisotropic membrane. The notion, which they now looks like a no-brainer, how could you possibly get a patent on a thing like that? Well, it was, a, uh, it was a pretty good idea at the time that you could make a membrane that was a thin, dense skin on a micropore substructure. And that was, the, that was the way to make high flux materials. And that's what's been used ever since. So, so this was uh, uh, poor old Sid. He, he, he didn't make a fortune, but he did be, he wasn't, uh, what is it, fame or fortune? Well, he got fame, but maybe a little less fortune. So this is uh, how it went. And it was maybe fortuitous that the lobe serogen membrane turned up at that time. And that's because concurrently, and not, not think, nothing to do with uh, the lobe serogen membrane, but concurrently, the US government decided they wanted to figure out how to desalt water. And so they set up what's called the Office of Saline Water. And for about 10 years, this was a, a section of the Department of the Interior. For about 10 years, there was a flood of money, uh, uh, research money. It was about $100 million a year or more in, in today's money. Every year, another $100 million. It went out to the world to, to figure out how to desalt water. And they started off with multi-stage flash and all that. But pretty soon, it was clear reverse osmosis was the way to go. And that, took, that lasted for about 10 years. And during that time, the technology was developed. And the key portion of the technology was, was how do you package, because even with the lobe serogen membrane, you needed a lot of membrane to, 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 to really make useful amounts of, of, of water. So you had to figure out how, how to package that membrane. 
And, and there were many different ways of doing it. The two that really emerged after some time were, are what's called holofine fibers. These are tiny little tubes, made of plastic tubes, tiny, about as thick as your hair, uh, which uh, the, sh the, the brine is on the outside, the water is on the inside. Or you could make flat sheet membranes and make them into spiral wound modules. And that was, uh, that was through to the early 1970s. And so at that time, that's a now a little over 10 years after Loeb, had, Loeb and Surajan had, had made their first membrane, the, there was an industry. It was working. There were, there were plants out there. There was a, an industry. It was small. And the reason it was small is the big application was seawater. They wanted to desalt seawater. And the membranes they had at that time didn't quite do it. To desalt seawater in a single pass, you need a membrane that has a rejection of more than 99.3. That means that less than 0.7% of the salt in, in the, in the seawater can go through the membrane. Otherwise, there's too much salt in the permeate, and you don't want to drink it. So, so you have to have 99.3. And if you made hollow fiber membranes, they, in fact, some of them at least, could desalt the water. The problem was that they had very low flux. Whereas the lobe uh, uh, flat sheet membrane put into a spiral wound module had almost 10 times the flux, but didn't have enough selectivity. So, there was a so if you wanted to desalt water, you, mostly they were using this and they were passing the water through the membrane twice. And that didn't hack it. But then something else turned up. And that was this invention, a guy called John Cadot. John Cadot was a big fella. Uh, when I first went to America, I thought, boy, these guys are beefy. I mean, he was uh, <laughs> fairly, fairly sort of bulky sort of guys. And John Cadot was that sort of guy, big guy, very quiet, very, uh, uh, well, it wasn't a big chatty guy mixing with all the fellows, talking to the girls, not at all. Um, John Cadot uh, just sat in the back of the last and rarely asked a question, but he was good. And at that time, he was getting money from the Office of Saline Water, as was I, as was a whole bunch of other dudes. It was a great system. You, they gave you money. You paid for your research. They gave you even got a salary. Um, but at the end of every year, you had to write a report. And so you sent your report to the Office of Sailing Water, and then they sent it to everybody else. So everybody knew what you were doing, but consequently also, you knew what everybody else was doing. There was no such thing as a secret. So John Cadot started putting in his reports a way of making what's called an interfacial composite membrane. And what it was. So he took a, 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 a polysulfone microporous membrane and he soaked the membrane in a, a, a polyamine solution uh, in water. And then he took that, he patted off this surplus water from the top of the top of the membrane surface, and then he then he immersed that that film into a solution of hexane with a, a diacid or triacid chloride in the hexane. And these two components will react to form this sort of structure. They're very reactive. Uh, and that the reaction takes place at the interface between the two, the hexane and, and the water. So boom, it f f reacts, it forms a film, and then it stops. And the reason it stops is that the, in order for the reaction to continue, either the acid chloride has to diffuse into the amine solution, or the amine has to diffuse into the acid chloride solution, and now they both have to go through this, this polymer layer. So it, there's a very quick reaction. You get a, a very thin film, a dense polymer film, and then the thing stops. And it's also defect-free, because if there is a place where you've got a pinhole or something, 
then uh, uh, what the, the ipso facto, as we say, um, you, you got a place where water and, and, uh, and, the, amine, and the hexane are going to meet, so it seals up. So automatically, all defects disappear too. So it was, it was great. All right, so, so I get John Cadot's report. And uh, I, I'd been, there was some gossip and whatever, so I was ready for it. And, and there it was, and he's claiming I'm getting 99.3, 99.4, and so forth. Now, at that time, if you were making lobe serrage in membranes like me, you typically would make 98%, something like that. And, and occasionally, you might make 99%. 99%, you would then go home, have a beer, kick the dog, and, uh, and you know, this is a good day. So, so, so when somebody said 99.4, this just wasn't, uh, it, I, it was too good to be true. I just didn't believe it. But in fact, I made one. And it's an amazingly forgiving process because with my first membrane, I got 99.3. And, and this, I, this uh, I really have to say, this is one, one of those equations. I, my socks were blown off. Uh, I, this was something. And it made reverse osmosis a, a, a viable way of desalting seawater. And so right now, that process in the next uh, 20, 30 years has really taken off. Even so, most of the plants are using John Cadot's membranes. In fact, 90% of the plants are using John Cadot's membranes or, uh, or variants, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But basically, his, his formulation, his membrane, and this plant, uh, is, this is a typical large plant, it's at Ashkelon in Israel, it has 40,000 spiral wound modules. Each one of these tubes has about six of these modules in series, and there's, as you can see, a whole bunch of tubes. So there's about one and a half million square meters of membrane in this plant, and it makes about 100 million cubic meters per year of water. That's enough for a city of about uh, maybe a one and a half million, something like that, uh, a, mi a million or so. So, you know, it's a bunch of water. And it, the other things uh, that, that emerged when, when that, that industry, as of today, there were basically three producers. Uh, it's a little bit like motor cars. You know, in, in 1900, there were 40 companies making motor cars. And then by 19, 1960, they were down to three, at least in the U.S., uh, you know, General Motors, uh, Ford, and whatever. So, so there's a lot of consolidation. So about three companies, Dow, Film Tech, and two, two Nito and Torre in Japan, they have about 80% market share. They all make the same sort of Jonkadot membrane. And one thing that has happened is, that, is the energy consumption of the process has come down from five to 10 kilowatt hours per cubic meter to about two to three. I mean, that's just a matter of polishing, squeezing, reducing, more efficiency, whatever, and so forth. But, and there's no, well, maybe the introduction of uh, pressure retarding, uh, pressure recovery systems uh, on the residue, but there, there was no real big breakthrough. Just grinding away at it over, over incremental improvements over 30 years. It came down. And the cost of membrane modules is now $10 per meter squared. That is something. A, me a membrane in a module, 10 bucks a meter squared. And the cost of desalted seawater <coughs> has been constant for the last 40 years. When I, when I came to uh, America, uh, gasoline was 20 cents a gallon. Right now, it's uh, somewhere around three bucks. So uh, it's, it's gone up a lot as has as any, anything else. But seawater, desalted seawater, has stayed almost constant. So that's the sort of story of, uh, of reverse osmosis. I want to talk a little bit about a related process, which is electrocoat paint. And, uh, well, electrocoat paint and ultrafiltration. Reverse osmosis, I got it. This is the plot of nominal pore diameter for various processes. So reverse osmosis is separating water from salts. So the pores, if they're there at all, are very, very small. And, but 
you can make by very similar processes. So, I mean, so the, the way you make the membrane is just a little bit different. It's not a big change, but, but a little bit different. You can make the membrane more open. So the pores are maybe from 20 angstroms to say 1,000 angstroms. It depends on the formulation. And, and that means you can make membranes that don't separate salt from water. Salt and water and sucrose maybe would all go through. Microsolutes go through but you start rejecting proteins or, or influenza viruses, bacteria. You would reject them with that sort of membrane. So there was a place for, for membranes of this type too. And, but the problem was that uh, well, th this process had a, had a number of problems, so it took off after RO, but it, it was in fact enough. And this was the first big application. It was developed by some guys at Abcor. And it was for electrocoat paint. And electrocoat paint was a new process to paint automobiles or washing machines or any big, big complicated metal part. What you did was uh, you took the car and you sprayed it with various chemicals to get rid of the rust and the junk and whatever, degreaser. So you now had a shiny, shiny little auto going, going along on a, on a on a, on a conveyor belt. And then you got to a swimming pool of electrocoat paint and you dropped the car in the swimming pool of paint. And you put a slight charge on the car, positive or negative, you could do it either way. And then this, the paint was latex paint. So little particles of, of latex in this swimming pool, about 10% latex, it, like, like you might do the walls of your house. So it's pretty concentrated paint, but all of those little particles had a charge, the opposite sign to, to what you put on the car. And what would happen was that paint particles would then migrate to the car, neutralize, and you'd end up with a, a monolayer of deposited uh, electrocoat paint on every metal, part, every metal surface. Because wherever there was a little bit like interfacial composite membrane, wherever was a bare piece of, of metal, there was still a gradient for the, for the particle to get to the, get to the car part. So it was a great way of, of painting cars. When, it, when they came out of the, uh, the swimming pool, you rinsed them off uh, with uh, countercurrents, rinse tank system, and, and so you had a painted car. Now the problem was that some of this cleaning stuff came in with a car, and some of this water from the rinsing step also went into the, into the, into the tank as, as the car came out. And so you began to fill up the tank and dilute it with, with water and ions. And so the, a great solution, this was a great solution. They, they had other solutions which they, which they hated, but this one worked. You took a pump, you pumped the solution across the surface of this membrane, and by doing that, you bled out some water. You remove, the membrane could remove the electrocoat paint particles and send them back to the tank. And this water had microsolutes and, and water, and you just bled it off. It was a great application, uh, but this was a hell of a pump. The, the, the only way you can maintain with that, this, remember this is paint. It's, a, uh, it's latex paint. You pour it out, it's pretty viscous and all the rest of it. The only way you could maintain the membrane clean was you had to recirculate the water at a very high rate. And so by doing that, you, you, you could maintain the membrane clean. Even so, they didn't last for, for long, maybe six months or a year if you were lucky, and then you replaced the membrane modules. So this was, but the economics were so compelling, you got your money back within a, within a few months that, uh, that everything uh, worked. So, so this, this application got, the, got ultrafiltration off the ground. And then it began to be used in a number of other sort of relatively small processes with high value separations. The, the problem was fouling. Uh, you, all of these, with ultrafiltration, the membranes fouled and, and the fluxes declined and the process sort of ground to a halt unless you had a very large pump recirculating water like crazy. So, but even so, by the mid-1950s, 1990s, the, the thing was doing okay. Now, everybody knew at that time that 
there were some great applications in municipal water. Um, and the first one of these that, that, that actually happened was this one, uh, the treatment of drinking water uh, in, in, in municipal water treatment plants. And then the next one that happened uh, just a few years later was uh, the treatment of sewage water at a, at, a, at a water treatment plant. But let's look at the first one. Uh, this was here, uh, a bit of luck for the industry. Um, in 1993, there was a cryptosporidium uh, outbreak in Milwaukee. And 100 people died. A whole bunch of people got sick. And 100 people died. It, this was bad news. And uh, it was because this, 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 this whatever, protozoa uh, got into the water system. And, uh, I mean, it was bad news. It was, it was a catastrophe. The EPA then mandated that anybody who was taking uh, a, a drinking water from a surface stream, like a, like a river, or direct, if you were taking it directly out of the river or out of a lake, then you had to have more than just chlorination. You had to have a, a primary sterilization technique, and then chlorination would, was like a backup to, to keep it sterile or, or prevent if there was one or two guys got through, the chlorination would knock them off. So you had to have the uh, uh, braces and a belt. So, so, okay, so a huge market suddenly appeared. And in fact, membranes were sort of ready for it by 1993. The costs of the process had been coming down and down and down, it, not just in ultrafiltration, but in reverse osmosis, the way you packaged the membranes, the way you made the membranes, the costs had been coming down. And so they were, it, was, it was economical to do this. And as soon as they started building some big plants, the prices, the costs came down even more. So this really became quite a, quite a, a good way of, of treating water. And the good thing about it was the water was clean. The fouling problem was almost not there because it was, it was drinking water. There wasn't much there to begin with, a few bacteria or cryptosporidium or, or whatever, but not much. And so the process used to reduce the bacteria count by about 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5. So it didn't exactly make it sterile because even a tiny, tiny pinhole would start let some of the, some of the guys through, but not many. And these plants were 10 to 100 times bigger than the industrial applications people had been doing up to that point. So, so happy days. that they, uh, There was a little bit of a boom going on. And then a few years later, uh, they began to use these membranes in a, in a very different way to treat sewage water. I mean, now sewage water is about 1% one, 1 solids. So uh, it's not 99% pure, it's 1% unpure. So, so sewage is, is a bit of an issue. And, and in fact, I back, when I first went to, to America, I worked at a company called Amacon. Yeah, the Amacon was in Boston, and, and it, was a, it was a little membrane company. And they had a joint project with an outfit called Dor Oliver uh, in, in Connecticut. And I made the membranes, and Dor Oliver uh, had, a, had, a, had a pilot plant in the uh, sewage treatment works uh, in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. And so I would go down to the Greenwich, Connecticut uh, sewage treatment plant with my membranes. We'd put them in, and then after a bit, they would foul. Uh, the problem was, here was the activated sludge reactor where the, where the waste water is being sort of uh, biodegraded, and they take a pump and pump it around and around and around across the surface of the membrane, and this is the permeate. And now this permeate is very good quality. I mean, you couldn't exactly drink it, but, but it was pretty good. Uh, it was way better than you could make by the conventional technology. The problem was that, that the process didn't last too long. Uh, even with this pump really working uh, hard, maintain the surface of this membrane clean. Fouling was, was death. And um, so one of the things I, I learned was fouling was a real problem. And the other thing I learned is it's, you got to be careful about saying it'll never work. Because in this, never is a long time. 
and in this particular case, about 30 years. And, and then some guys did get it to work. At Xenon, Kuboto, Mitsui, and Memtech, they all came out about the same time with variants of this process. And how did they solve the fouling problem? Well, the first thing they did was to lower the pressure of the process below what's called the critical pressure. I, I won't go into that. But in this process, when we were doing it uh, at Oliver, we, we instinctively, your, your flux is going down. So what do you do? Well, turn up the driving force. And so the flux would go down a bit more. You turn it up some more. So we, we were operating pretty, uh, maybe 50 to 100 pounds. Here, they're operating at, at, at maybe five pounds or 10, uh, 10 pounds less. So they lowered the pressure. That meant the flux were low, but it meant that fouling was much, much more easy to control because you were pushing less, less water through the membrane. And the other thing they did was short-cycled back flushing. Um, what would happen is for maybe 10 minutes, you would operate the system with the, with the feed going into the permeate. And then for about 30 seconds, you would reverse the process. You'd, you'd pressurize the permeate and, 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 and have it going from permeate to, to feed. What that did was any junk that had been deposited on the membrane surface got lifted off by the reverse flow. And then they had air scrubbing. They, they didn't pump the water around. Some guys do, but, but most of them uh, scrub the membranes by pushing in compressed air at the bottom these bubbles would bubble up between the membrane surfaces, and that's enough if you've got back flushing going on to keep the membranes relatively clean. And so the result was it worked. It worked. And, the, and uh, these membranes, or these, this process, the submerged membranes, will, will last for months before you, maybe periodically, you might turn the plant off, chemically clean the membranes, and then turn it back on again. So, so it may go months or even, even as much as a year without having to really do something with the membrane. So a whole bunch of these plants have now been installed. And this, this another, I mean, there was a boom going on for a time. This is a multi-billion dollar business now. Uh, probably several billion dollars a year uh, this, this away. along with the nitrogen. 
So those two inerts get into the process. And there's no way for them to get out. Uh, they, they just go around and around until they start building up to about 10 or 20% of, of the gas. The concentration of the gas in this reactor is now 10 to 20% of, of these inerts. At which point, uh, you've got to do something. And so what the guys do, and used to do in the past, they'd have a little purge. And the purge purged out the concentrated uh, nitrogen and uh, methane, but it also purged out hydrogen, which was valuable. And in the past, they would just use There, there were 50 or 100 of these. There were a fair number of ammonia plants. They all had this issue, and suddenly you could fix it. It was a, a, a no-brainer. So gas, gas separation for, for hydrogen took off, and then fairly rapidly thereafter, once the stuff was learned, the next big application was nitrogen from air, and then a, a little while later, the separation of CO2 from methane in a natural gas plant. And these, th these ones in particular are pretty big plants. So this, this is what a, a, a CO2 plant in a natural gas thing looks like. It's, um, this is uh, in Pakistan. It, it, at the time, it was the biggest one in the world. It's, they've had two expansions, six. I think this is now about a 2 billion standard cubic feet a day plant. And the problem was the gas had about 6.5% CO2. It, in some ways, you could use that gas, but in general, if you want to put the gas in the pipeline, you have to get it down to less than 2% CO2. Otherwise, there's, the corrosion's too bad. So you have to dry the gas, you have to get rid of, get the gas down to less than 2%, and, and so that, this plant did it by permeating the CO2 and leaving all the hydrocarbons behind, and, and this is a, a, a huge plant, and this is some guy taking a stroll uh, uh, at lunch, so big plant. So right now, uh, the gas separation industry is not as big as water. There's more water than gas, but uh, the biggest uh, single application is nitrogen from air. There's, there's probably about more than 100,000 of these units dotted around. These are all s relatively small, uh, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000. A real big one might be 100,000, not, not big. Um, every, every plane, or, or at least every uh, commercial jet, uh, has, a, has a nitrogen plant on it to, to inert the, uh, the, 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 the gas tanks of the, of the plane. So uh, uh, it's a large number of these things around, huh? lots and lots of them. Hydrogen from nitrogen in ammonia plants or refineries, are fairly biggish units. And then CO2 from methane, uh, there's probably about 400 million... 400 units out there, of which there may be 
50 are big ones like the picture I just showed you. And then there's then the other uh, separations. So, 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 so much for gas, uh, gas separation. Just to sum up, what, what, is the, what is the technology look like today? It's an established unit operation. Um, it's a large market, uh, probably somewhere in the $20 billion a year range. It's gone up a thousand fold over, over the last 50 years. So, so more than 20 billion. And they're served by more or less experienced companies. It's, it's, it's an established technology and an established unit operation. And it probably is in textbooks. I guess that I, I, I don't teach unit operation courses, but, but, but apparently it's in. It's in. Good, good. Um, the membrane module costs have come down 10 to 100 fold over the last uh, 40 years. And it's that, that reduction in cost that made all, all of these processes work. They, they, they would have worked, in, in one sense, on a, technically they would have worked 40 years ago or 50 years ago, but it took a, quite a while before they could work economically. And it was, that was what was, was, was going on. And, and what made that possible was this reduction in membrane cost, module cost, and even the process. How, how do you put the thing together? All of those reduced costs 10 to 100 fold over the last 40 years. And, and as a result, there are many, I, I don't know quite how many, but, but a large number of plants with over a million square meters of membrane, gas separation plants, but also water plants of, of different types. And this is, this is my last slide, so I'm, the drinks are, uh, will be coming up soon. Um, there's still room for a few big app, new big applications, <coughs> I think. Now, this, this gets more speculative. <coughs> Carbon dioxide from power plant flue gas. Um, the glo global warming is around. There's a whole bunch of, there's some ish people, some people believe, some people don't. I think most people with a brain think it's probably true. Um, <laughs> the, the, in my lifetime, the amount of CO2 uh, the, that is going into the atmosphere from, 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 from us has gone up uh, eightfold in my lifetime. And you might say, well, it's all your fault. Uh, but, in, <laughs> but in fact, if it goes up eightfold in the lifetime of the youngest person in this room, uh, I'm dead, thank God, but you are toast. Uh, <laughs> so it's got to be fixed. And one of the ways to fix it is to take the CO2 out of the power plant flue gas. When you burn a coal or natural gas, you produce CO2, it goes into the atmosphere. About a third of the CO2 that's going into the atmosphere every day is coming from these power plants. And the good thing about them is they're relatively discrete sources. Uh, I mean, uh, they're big. Uh, a regular power plant might produce a million tons of CO2 every year. But it's a discrete source. It's not like a motor car. Putting in a, a capture system on every motor car is, is not going to work. But you could imagine putting a capture system on a power plant. And OK, so th that's a great application. And membranes can do it. It's, it's again, we're back to the old okay, thing. Membranes can do it. We've actually proved that. The issue is, can they do it economically? Right now, they would double the cost of electricity. And nobody's going to want to do that. So they'll do more research, they'll try to drive the cost down. But at some point, it may well take off. Uh, the next one, I think, vapor-vapor uh, separations to replace distillation. There are 40,000 distillation columns in the US. I mean, there are a bunch of columns. It's about 40% or thereabouts of the energy that the, the, the chemical and uh, refining industry uses is used in distillation columns. They, 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 they do a great job, but they use a bunch of energy. And they're very, in terms of theoretical efficiency, they're fairly bad. Again, uh, this would be a, uh, a great place to use membranes. And some membranes work. Uh, for instance, the separation of, uh, of, of water from ethanol or isopropanol, that, that's, an, that's an azeotrope. So in every bioethanol plant, they have, they have distillation to get to the azeotrope, 
and then they have to somehow remove the last bit of water. And they do that mostly by, by molecular sieve. But you could do it with a membrane. And right, right now, no one's building many bioethanol plants. And anyway, the membranes maybe aren't quite there. But, but it's, it's close, it's, it's right on the edge. So that may actually happen. And it, it, that's the sort of introductory application like petro, uh, electrocoat paint that will gradually leverage the thing, I think, off the ground. Uh, the third one is water. Um, water recycling is actually practiced in, in a number of places. So, uh, <laughs> nothing else you can do about it. But, uh, and it's practiced in many places. In a, in a sort of an indirect way. Uh, I, I'm told that the Rhine River, they use the water four times before it finally escapes to the North Sea. So they take it out in one, one place, they use it, and it dribbles back into the river, somewhat treated, and then, uh, then they do it a second time and so forth. But here, the connection is, is sort of nebulous. Uh, you know, the plants are 10 miles apart and there's a river in between. Um, but but you can make it fairly, fairly thing. So this, this is a reality, and this will happen. Nanofiltration, oops, nanofiltration and ultrafiltration of organic fluids. I think that, that one has some hope. It's got to be hard, high pressure, high cost, low flux, okay, whatever. And, and then the last one, I, I, I've always liked this one. I, I worked on it once, I never got it off the ground. It, 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 hydrometallurgy. It, in the old days, when you, when you dug up copper, you, you dug it up and you, 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 know, you had various physical methods to, to concentrate the ore and then you put it in a smelter and you made copper. Uh, nowadays, the grade of the copper is sort of going down. All the high-grade copper that they, f they found, we've mostly extracted. There's still some around, but we're mostly extracted. The grade of copper is going down. The way the guys are doing it, in part, is they have sprinklers. They pile up the, 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 the copper ore, and then they put a sprinkler on top, sprinkling sulfuric acid. And, and it dribbles through, and it extracts the copper as copper sulfate and a bunch of other stuff in, in the, in the, at the bottom of the, of the dump. And then that, that's a small river of copper sulfate solution is, is, is now sort of going, and they, they separate out the copper from this solution. And then they, they take the solution, regenerated sulfuric acid, and send it back to the, to the dump. So it's, it, and the way they separate it right now is a solvent extraction, which isn't a whole bunch of guys going like this with a, uh, a, a little glass thing. It's, it's a massive piece of equipment, but it must be a whole, it's a horrible process. And, and okay, membranes can do that too. Right now, uh, just in the laboratory. But, but in the end, I think, this is, a, this is going is a, if I was uh, 23 when I left this place, if I was leaving now, I might, oh, this is interesting. I, I might try that. So, this is my last slide. Thank you. So Richard, thank you very much for uh, a, a very interesting and informative introduction and a tour of the development of the membrane technology industry. And I'd like to give you this little oh. gift from the department for coming and giving the lecture oh, this afternoon. Thank you. So, a box, of, a box of candles. But don't go just yet because there may be some questions oh. from the audience. Well, I give you back my box. <laughs> Yes, the back. We'll bring you a mic. We'll bring you a uh, microphone to. My question is on the uh, the percentage. The maximum you've got is um, about ninety nine point four. There about. Is there any? Is there any? Um, if you had to, if you had to. Um, use a different technology, or if you were to increase it to 100%, what direction do you think one should go, or you would go to? Um, well, there is... Uh, some people do want 100% removal of water, uh, so ions from the water, and that's called ultra-pure water. 
which they use, uh, for example, a boiler feed water, like a steam boiler. You want pure water. You don't want any junk in it, because when you boil it, the junk stays behind. Or in the electronics industry or in the pharmaceutical industry, you want water that's no salt, no, no, no nothing, just water. And uh, they use RO to remove the bulk of the water, uh, the, the salts. And then, and they start with drinking water. So they don't start with seawater. They use reverse osmosis and remove 99% of the salts from reverse osmosis, uh, from uh, municipal drinking water. So it only starts off at 100 ppm, might left with 1 ppm. And then they use iron exchange, and then sometimes other processes to get that last 1%. They, they're, got, they're trying to go down to not ppm, but, but pp. B and uh, PPB or less, the fraction of a PPB. Uh, so, that, so that is in fact done, but, but then with a hybrid process. Matthias. So, initially. So, the first desalination process was basically uh, based on evaporation. The second one on reverse osmosis, mm -hmm. selective membrane transport. Is there anything else that is going to disrupt that? It's, I mean, you know, the guys have got the cost down so low, so the, and the energy, you know, the, uh, two or three That's right, yes. kilowatt hours per, per cubic meter. That's about maybe two to three times the theoretical minimum. So it, but it's electricity, so you've got to be a little careful because the guys will say, some, some guys at least will say, well, multi-stage flash uses seven kilowatts. So it's it clearly, but multi-stage flash uses heat. So three to one uh, multi-stage flash is actually pretty damn efficient as well. Um, but I, I think uh, right now RO's got, what, 70, 60, 70% market share. And the other 30% is uh, evaporation where, where you're making electricity and you've got some waste heat. But then... Or, you got a, or maybe you've got a nuclear plant and you're, you've got waste heat, <coughs> then, then you would use multi-stage flash because the heat is free and uh, whatever. But it's 50% it's recovery only, right? So 50% yeah. of the water that is pre-treated extensively mm -hmm. is basically waste. Yeah. It goes to... Uh, Wouldn't that would be an incentive, right? To uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's never going to work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Ian. Mark my words. <laughs> so, but for your future challenges, I was wondering about what about air separation? Rather than, say, CO2 from your flue gas, what about, what about air separation instead? Mm -hmm. And then you run an oxy combustion, and, you know, your, your CO2 separation is going to be more difficult. You've mm -hmm. got more, you know, other species in there. Yeah. How about doing the air separation instead as a challenge? Uh, I, I looked at it. We looked at it a lot. Um, it, it's one of those, again, a, a separation that is technically doable, uh, you, not to make pure oxygen. That, that one's uh, uh, an impossible dream. But, um, but to make, say, 30 40% oxygen, uh, oxygen-enriched air, which you would then use in, in like any combustion process, you would actually reduce, make, improve the efficiency of the process because a lot of the uh, loss of efficiency of a combustion process is, is the heat that goes out with the exhaust gas. The exhaust gases go out pretty hot. And if you used oxygen enriched air, there would be, you've removed the bulk of the nitrogen, so now the volume of exhaust gas would go down. So many things would, would be beneficial if you could use, make 30% oxygen cheap. And that's the problem. Uh, Cryogenic uh, uh, separations are, I mean, l liquid air is pretty damn good. Uh, and at least when we looked at it and we worked at it we, it, 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 we just couldn't do it. There may be one or two places where, for whatever reason, the guy needed it right here, and the nearest liquid air plant was, you know, 200 miles away or something. Then, then maybe. But we, we, we just couldn't get it down cheap enough. Maybe, maybe, in the, in the future. Richard, while the audience are thinking, can I ask you a question? So it's one that was on my mind earlier today. Is, in, and I'm thinking here about uh, budding entrepreneurs who are thinking about going out and starting a membrane company, because as you can tell from mm -hmm. 
Richard's talk, I think membranes is a great area for startups and entrepreneurial activity. Is the membrane business fundamentally a capital business or is it a consumables business? So, you know, oh. if you're starting a membrane company, should you be thinking about selling plants, mm -hmm. which are one-off sales, you're going to make them once mm -hmm. to a customer, or are you thinking about a business where you're going to get repeat sales of membranes as they want replacements? Uh, for the most part, uh, you, you better make your money on the front end uh, because the lifetime of most membrane process, reverse osmosis, at the beginning, uh, the lifetime of the membranes was maybe one year, two years. Now, uh, the guys want guarantees, guarantees for seven years, and, and they will, in fact, last longer. So they've, they've reduced cost by, by getting the lifetime of the membranes up and up and up. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, you, if, if you sold a plant and the, the guy had to change out the modules every year, I mean, this was a great business in, uh, in, in ultrafiltration because, uh, you know, the membrane <laughs> modules were maybe a third of the cost of the plant. So, so you, you put the plant in and then uh, as, as the electro coat paint chewed them up, you put in new modules. And, and for maybe 10 years, people were doing that, replacing the modules every year. But even in a, a very demanding application like that, now they're lasting two or three years. And the, and the cost of the modules has gone way down too. So, yeah, most, you, most applications, you've got to make it on the front end. Ryan. Ethan, sorry. <laughs> um, I was wondering what your thoughts on the FO and PRO processes are and whether or not they have a future at all. Uh, you, the, the guy in front of you uh, was, was trying to, to make the point that, that um, in reverse osmosis, you, you desalt, you take the, you make desalted water and you make brine. And the brine has twice the concentration of salt as the beginning, maybe a little less. It goes from 3% from to 6% or something like that. And, and he's right. Uh, the, if you, uh, you put all this energy to make clean feed, feed and then uh, you only remove half the water. Why don't you remove more water? Well, you don't remove more water with reverse osmosis because the osmotic pressure is just going up and up and up. And so there are these PR, uh, whatever, uh, uh, th these other processes to do it. Um, I, none of them, they, none of them. working with it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think that I, I'd be surprised if they work. But, but I've learned never say never. <laughs> Okay, well, that's a, a great point to thank Richard again. Thank you very much.